We're truly honored by the presence of these philanthropists. These are three individuals who have given their time, their treasure, and their talent to solving some of our world's most critical challenges. Now, it's not very often that you see three high-powered philanthropists on a podium together, on a stage together. And so I'm going to actually start with the distinguished general. I am speaking with you on a panel exploring collaborative approaches to end neglected diseases in Africa. And I know, sir, that you have personally been affected by river blindness, and you also have seen the devastating effects of neglected diseases on our people. Why did you personally get involved in trying to address this? And what have you been able to accomplish? Thank you. As a young army officer, at the age of 26, 27, a captain, I led my company of soldiers up the Mambila Plateau for two weeks on foot along the Nigerian Cameroon border, inoculating and treating uh, villagers at that time. So our efforts was to try and bring the presence of government to the people. Our flag march, which is what my operation was called, lasted two weeks. At the end of it, I returned to Kaduna and joined the rest of the battalion. Two years later, one day I woke up and found that one of my eyes was swollen and I couldn't see through that eye. I went to the hospital, the general hospital in Kaduna had a clinic, I, th I think it's still there, called uh, Guinness Eye Hospital. I was tested by an Indian professor, Professor Ba, B-H-A-R. who, after asking me about my movements, uh, took me into, on, a on a couch and took a snippet of my skin, placed it in a microscope. After fiddling with it for a minute or two, he asked me to come and see. So, General Tanjima, you definitely have a memory that I cannot, I mean, quantify. The fact that you remember the doctor almost 50 years ago, his name is remarkable. But I want you to get straight to why the foundation is now focusing on what you personally went through, which is river blindness and other neglected diseases. So, you decided to establish a foundation that would now help others avoid what you just went through. And we commend you for that and the great work that the T.Y. Danjima Foundation is doing. What's unique about T.Y. Danjima Foundation, unlike many other foundations in Nigeria, is that you actually give grants to organizations that work in the health space. I commend you for that. Please give him a round of applause. Now, why did, have you chosen to give grants in this space instead of doing it yourself? I uh, was dragged into given grant by a young lady who's somewhere here in the room. <laughs> uh, 
Franco. Stella. <laughs> Franca came to me, my office, and told me about what I already know about river blindness, and told me about the prevalence of that disease in Taraba State, my state, which I already knew. But what I didn't know was that somebody was doing something about it. She told me that drugs for treatment of river blindness is available, is donated and brought to Nigeria free of charge to the country but the responsibility for distributing these drugs rests on our shoulders and that this is not being done effectively. She needed a vehicle to assist in the distribution of the drugs and she been promised by the state governor whose area, incidentally, is the most endemic area of uh, river blindness in the state. These promises were not being fulfilled. She wanted me to buy a vehicle for her, and I did. Fantastic. Please give him a round of applause. I'll come back to you. Fantastic. So I think... General T.Y. Danjuma has demonstrated the power of partnerships. He has the resources, he's learned from his experience, he's partnered with a dynamic organization to do good work on the ground. So that's just a perfect example and a great segue to Mrs. Titsi Masiwa, who's another individual who believes in partnerships. Through the work you've been doing, through the Higher Life Foundation, you've been altering the education landscape across Africa. Now, you're very humble about the impact you've made, and we recognize that, but you also understand the power of education and health, and the need to address both of them collaboratively. Can you tell us a bit about why you partnered with the End Fund and what you've been able to accomplish? Thank you very much, Ndidi. First of all, I want to say I'm really honored to be uh, sitting on a and doing a fireside chat with uh, one of our own heroes in philanthropy, General Dajuma. Uh, the work that you've done is an example that inspires the younger generation to do more. And I know that those of you are younger than me, and I pray that you're also, the fire is catching on for you to do even more than what we, we've heard and also Bill's my boss, so I have to be careful what I say here. <laughs> he is the chairman of the End Fund, and I know his family contributes a lot, millions of dollars towards the work that is really uplifting the lives of African children all over the continent. And we play a very small part. I, we play uh, two roles, serving on the board and also providing resources. We do the last mile work, which is using the local resources we, ha we have, uh, um, primarily in Zimbabwe, to partner with the end fund to get the medication to the uh, individuals in the communities, to the schools, to the um, uh, townships, to the rural homes where people who need the kind of drugs that are administered in order to end the, um, um, the NTDs that affect so many of our people. Now our model, uh, Ndidi, I think is very much based on uh, listening, like some of the examples that were given earlier or suggestions made, listening to the needs on the ground and getting to understand how do you if, if, do your philanthropy effectively? Number one, we recognized there was a stronger partner than us who understood 
what the business of NTDs was, which is the end fund. And the CEO of the end fund, she, she again is a phenomenal woman. It's Ellen. Yeah, I said well, we need to give her honorary citizenship in Nigeria and the rest of Africa. Okay, 54. We need to give an AU passport for the work that she does. So I was inspired by number one, uh, having a, an organization that has a vision that was start, started by entrepreneurs who put a fund together and who cherish to see the lives of uh, 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 individuals really uh, touched and uh, young people given an opportunity to live their purpose uh, through um, eradicating uh, some of these uh, diseases. So the vision was there, the uh, passion was there, the structure on the ground allowed us to be able to use uh, local resources. And initially when I said, I, I can't uh, send US dollars, and we earn in local currency, and then we, I can't convert that, send it to the US and send it back to the continent. Can we structure our giving in such a way that we use local resources? And the understanding and the willingness of, uh, for me for, on the, at board level and at the operational level really got us to be uh, a, a catalyst in quickly ensuring that the drugs, before they expire, we have the resources and the people to get the uh, drugs to the uh, people on the ground or the people who need them. Now, we also work in education, and we had realized that if our children are affected by tapeworm, they can't come to school, they are lethargic, low energy, and they're tired, they cannot learn. So, in a very efficient and inexpensive way, I mean, some of the drugs only cost 50 cents to be manufactured, but the, the cost is in the logistical support, the organizing to actually get them and finding the right partners on the ground. So we felt that the, given the investment that is already made to get the drugs on the ground and ne the negotiations that take place with the pharmaceutical companies, it would be such a, 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 an efficient and effective way if we could play our part in getting these drugs to as many people as possible to ensure that um, it, we could reach scale and, uh, and, and, and provide the, the needs on the ground. Another aspect indeed I wanted to highlight is the role that our company played. Now, I'm a big believer is in get to discuss these things at board level, get the people in operations to understand what role they can play without uh, asking them to part with money or to do uh, uh, things that would mess up their uh, profit models. So. Having a, a, a mobile telephone, telephone company really helped in negotiating with the company to provide SMS messaging to make sure that as many people could hear the message, messages about the, this uh, mass drug administrations that the end fund does. Now, let me tell you, they do them efficiently and effectively. In one year, they administer drugs, like in Zimbabwe, for instance, to 6 million people all over the country. And all they need is to take a handful of that medication and they're good to go for the rest of the year. So that's impact, it's efficient, and it's also sustainable in having local partnership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Masiwa. You've reinforced the importance of partnerships for scaling. And partnerships, not just the Higher Life Foundation playing its part, but also Econet wireless and using the power of technology to reach six million people in a year, which is unprecedented. Please give her another round of applause. <laughs> I think what both Mrs. Masiwa and General Danjima have illustrated is that in this game of impact in health and education, in any social sector, you have to be willing to partner and you have to be humble enough to realize what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and who else can do the job better. And that leads us to Bill. Because talking to Bill Campbell before this session over the telephone, I was amazed by his wealth of experience, his expertise, and the fact that he has become so passionate about the issue of neglected diseases. Coming from the private sector, Bill, what drew you in, and how has your private sector experience enabled you to effectively share such a transformational model. That's really one of the first of its kind. Well, I'll try to answer your question in a moment, but first of all, I want to say 
that I'm honored to be with the general and, and, and that you have you know, suffered from one of these diseases and have, 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 have gone back to your people in such an incredible way uh, through your foundation. So congratulations and I'm honored. Um, on this side, um, I, I, I suspect any of you that have ever met Tsitsi knows that I'm not her boss, uh, but, but, but I am honored uh, to be a, a, a colleague and co-conspirator with her on, uh, uh, at the End Fund, and, um, and, and I use the word conspirator de uh, deliberately in this case because we work really, really hard, and she you know, represents the African community on our board so incredibly well. And uh, CC, we couldn't do it without you, and we, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be your partner. So the End Fund is a partnership. Um, uh, it's, um, I, 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 I was trying to think of ways to express in some kind of economical way why we think we're different, and, and, and hopefully we, we, we are making the kind of progress that we'd make. Um, these neglected d diseases, uh, most of which people can't pronounce. Luckily, you had river blindness, so that's that's relatively that relatively easy. But schistosomiasis, lymphatic filariasis, elephantiasis. I'm working on it. You can s clearly see. But um, uh, the end fund, in terms of you know trying to be a, a different kind of partner to contribute these to these diseases that still affect over a billion people. Um, uh, we, we really like to think that we've sort of approached it in a, in a sensible, if not unique way, uh, by kind of employing more, better, faster. In our case, more means something different than it usually means, particularly in, in respect to philanthropy, in the sense that money's not our first problem. It's an important problem, but it's not our first problem. Uh, because the pharma companies and uh, the London Declaration, the Gates Foundations, you know, and Bill Gates himself have, have, have made all of these drugs available uh, as long as they can be, they can, you know, people will receive them with the appropriate education and that we can distribute them in an effective way. So our more is much more an umbrella kind of effect than, than just money. We've, the end fund has been quite successful and we're very proud of it as to how much money we have raised and you know, the Campbells have, have helped, <laughs> CC and, 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 and the Higher Life Foundation have helped um, and obviously the big funders like the Gates have done, done great jobs but, but our real problem is around better and faster than more than it is around, around the money. So on the better side, I like to think about the end fund as being uh, different uh, in terms of what I call MIC. Um, uh, the first piece is, is measure, that MIC, M is for measure in this case. And you know, I forget who said it first, but if you can and do measure, it will get better. Uh, and, 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 that inevitably happens. I mean, obviously, it doesn't always happen as quickly as you'd like it to happen, but if you do measure it, and you, you do measure the right things, eventually you will get improvement. And um, there's, there's been a lot of measurement going on in, in the NTD space, but I think that we've actually got it, you know, just that much better by using best practices. Um, I noticed you came from the Harvard Business School. We try to use every Harvard Business School set of letters we can. Uh, NIH, not invented here. Um, we, we, we just try to take best practices. Uh, you know, we, we inherited because of this wonderful situation uh, with the pharma companies. If we do a great job on the distribution and education, uh, in fact, we will be the low cost provider. And so far, where we're operating, we are the low cost provider. So on the measurement side, first part of better, we're doing pretty well. I, in MIC, is, is for involvement. And this goes kind of all the way from the board, 
Um, you know, Stitsi uh, and I are here. Uh, the management is all here, but they've in fact all come from the field. Uh, Seatsy and I have been in the field. We've raised money, uh, you know, walking over <laughs> over Victoria Falls, and you know, so so we are, uh, you know, we, everyone from the board all the way through to 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 the new hires are 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 are, are deeply involved. And most importantly, I think going back to something that the ambassador said, is that that in fact, pretty much everyone uh, that that is involved in our organization from the board down has done a mass drug administration. Um, uh, my daughter, who was 10 at the time, witnessed a trachoma operation restoring site. Um, uh, it, it, it's just part of what we do is that, that we get out and you know, we, we touch the people that are being affected. Uh, I love talking to teachers about what our mass drug administrations do for them. Um, and, and so that's a big part of, of the better part. Last thing, cooperation, uh, is that, you know, back to a little bit of the not invented here. There are great NGOs in the world. Uh, some of them are better than others. We try to pick the best one in the market in which we're operating because they deserve to get more business if they're doing it better already. Uh, and, and, and similarly, we're always trying to work as closely as possible, particularly with the Ministry of Health, but also the Ministry of Education and kind of anybody in the government that we could help with. So, better, and then the last word is faster. And, and frankly, if you do better really well and you do more really well, faster starts to take care of, of itself. So, um, you know, in that, in that regard, um, uh, we're, we, we really try to be uh, absolutely quick to market. Fantastic. Please give Bill a round of applause. I think we have a whole book coming out of Bill's speech. More, better, faster, make measurement, involvement, cooperation, and NIH not invented here. If every foundation would just take those nuggets, I think we'll all get better, faster, and the more will come. Now, I want to just quickly open it up to questions because I know that time is far spent and, I, and this is a very, very critical topic around neglected diseases, but health even more broadly. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question, introduce yourself and make it really swift. If there are no questions, I have a long list of additional questions I'll ask. There's one in the front. Okay. We have, a, we have comments here, and then let's go with uh, Jane. You can ask your question, and then we'll go with. Thank you. Uh, is this on? It is. I know that ending river blindness in Nigeria is a very high priority for Jimmy Carter as well. And I wanted to have a sense of all the players involved, because this is an extraordinary example of, of, of you know, non-profit coalition, I think it's Merck, is the, is, am I right, Bill, that it's Merck is the, is the drug company that is providing uh, cures for free. The Ministry of Health is deeply involved, leader of the stature of D.Y. Danjuma. Give us a sense of the range of the actors involved and the, the process for piecing together uh, such a coalition. Okay, great. Let's take the second comment. We'll just take a few together and then we'll... Yes. Uh, my name is Nana Kwabana. Uh, I am a producer. Uh, I'm an artist. Uh, I'm a DJ. Um, I've been able to work with some great people uh, like Jadena, actually. Um, Janelle Monet, so on and so forth. But another thing that I do is I have a nonprofit uh, called All One Blood and we work with sickle cell disease. Uh, which in America has also been labeled as the forgotten disease. Um, obviously, the continent, you know, we have the highest concentration of sickle cell disease uh, in prevalence, um, and particularly in Nigeria, the largest population of sickle cell disease is here in the world. And as someone that's kind of interacted with both music and medicine, uh, the way in which I realized that I needed to dedicate my life to both was actually when I spent time in Ghana. And I was doing a study at Confonoche, 37 Military Hospital, and working with children, looking at the idea of whether or not they disclosed or concealed 
the fact that they had sickle cell disease. And the thing that I found overwhelming was that most of these children would not disclose this disease whenever they had a sickle cell attack or a sickle cell crisis. They wouldn't tell their parents. And what they would do, for anyone that knows sickle cell disease, it's a very, very painful and debilitating disease. It's a disease that I suffer from. It's a disease that I've lost my younger brother to. So knowing the pain levels of what it comes like, or what comes with having sickle cell disease, you would have these children that would suffer this disease and suffer this pain crisis, hide in their closets so that they could hide from their parents. So their parents never saw them having this pain crisis, not because of their parents, but because they didn't want to be able to have to miss school the next day and have their friends and classmates wonder, what is it about this person? Why are they missing? Are they a sickler? And it was at that point that I realized we can have a lot of great research. We can have a lot of resources. We can have a lot of great minds in this space. But a big part of the reason why some of these diseases are forgotten and neglected is also because of the stigmas, the social stigmas that are attached to them, right? And you, if you have access to all of these things, but you have something internally where you can't actually disclose it and share it with the world, all the resources in the world don't matter. So my question to you is, what do you believe is the role in which entertainers, musicians, actors can play in relation to these kind of foundations to be much more effective in the way in which we reach people with these kind of diseases? Thank you. Thank you for that. So I think we'll take both questions together. Jane's question was around coalitions and how are we partnering across the board because obviously there's so much interest in this area. And then the second question around entertainers. I know you were shaking your head, so you have a, a response. Do you want to take the first question and then I, I'll go to the General Danjima as well. Go ahead. So on, um, let me go to the, uh, the second uh, comment that you made. Local voices are so important. Local players are important uh, uh, because they help facilitate the process of getting uh, the drugs to the individuals. But musicians, artists, through song, through poetry, through you have access and um, um, uh, sp you access to spaces that usually uh, philanthropists or business or governments would not be able to get to. So for me, it's very important if we can uh, begin to really, as a philanthropist, I'm right now sponsoring a, a, a musical project to get uh, youngsters to, who are highly talented to write songs with messages that help communities to, to share their problems and to also discuss what the issues are important to them and some of the solutions they want to see because people know what needs to be done. Uh, it, for me, philanthropists don't really come up with solutions. We just facilitate the process of getting the solution to where it needs to be. So I believe we need artists at board level to, because you must influence at the top and also at the bottom. So to be in strategic uh, positions where your voices are heard on what are some of the out of the box uh, activities or approaches we need to make to ensure that we talk about these things that uh, uh, have become a stigma in our societies. And then, of course, uh, we're coming up with music, poetry, and when you are interviewed, to talk and have the boldness to address the issues that either you have personally experienced or other people are experiencing. On the issue of, of um, so I'll leave Bill to talk about collaboration because I know at the end fund as exceptional partnerships at government level, at local level, and with uh, big farmers. So I'll leave you to address that one. Um, listen, I, I'll, I'll deal with the uh, communication and education ele element as well, in, in that the first mass drug administration I saw was in Rwanda, and they were, they were very well organized, and they were doing public health the way probably most of the people in this room saw it if you lived in a, in a, in a, in a city. Um, uh, the kids were lined up in the schoolyard, there was mu music playing, they'd had a poster contest, and I named what, they what the, the music was saying and the, and the poster contest, I called it Kill the Ugly Bugs. And, and, and in fact, we need education and awareness 
uh, around NTDs that, that can benefit dramatically from, from the artistic community. And it really doesn't matter whether it's visual, music, combinations, because there's still a big awareness problem. Uh, even amongst the, you know, the, the highly educated people that, that because it's, they're, they're, they're diseases of the very poor, and, and even if you've risen from the bottom, you really didn't know what was causing that, that, that stomach ailment, what was keeping you out of school. So there's a, big, there's a big awareness issue that certainly the entertainment industry, the artistic industry can really help us with. Okay. And then in terms of coalitions and partnerships, uh, General Danjuma, do you want to speak to that? Are you working with other organizations outside Nigeria on neglected diseases or partnering with other organizations locally to address neglected diseases or any of the other interventions your foundation makes? We, we have partners locally, but we are aware of something like rivalry that exists among uh, foundations in Nigeria. Um, I personally am reluctant to get involved in praise singing of our activities myself. But the nature of things are that unless you sing, you blow your own horn, you haven't done it. Our uh, uh, foreign partners are the manufacturers of the drugs that uh, we, we distribute. But my foundation also covers education. It covers income income um, generation and we try to also uh, do general health care of the people so we are all over the place and not just confined to uh, river blindness. Um, when I first made, announced my endowment of $100 million, I thought that was a lot of money. And so I was going to do all those things that I've just mentioned and even more, I was going to look after the widows of our civil war and so on and so forth. But very soon, I realized that the funds are not there. And we have to limit ourselves and, and focus more. But unfortunately, we already have, I have a a professor, two professors on my board of trustees, a, a medical doctor who is now a minister of state, of health in the federal government. You know, very powerful people already on the board. And each one of them being in charge of education, um, general uh, health care and each fighting for his own turf. I wanted to narrow down and say, look, we can't, we can't, we can't fund all those, those things. Let's just concentrate 
on health care and even health care, let's just concentrate on river blindness. I have not succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> So much. I think General Danjum has raised two critical issues which I'd like to come back to both Sitsi and Bill on. The issue of rivalry and the issue of focus. How have you successfully handled that at Higher Life Foundation? And then the end fund is obviously a best practice example. Bill, how have you been able to hold the board focused and keep rivals at bay? Go ahead. For me, uh, it starts with self. You start looking first at the log in your own eye before you look at the speck in your neighbor's eye. And facing the brutal facts. If you're after building a, a legacy around, uh, say, my name or my family, whatever, I just found that approach limited me and made me be looking, you know, people would come and offer, oh, if you give towards this, we'll name a building after you, we'll name a hospital after you, uh, and, you know, you, you will do a placard and put it in a particular prominent place with so-and-so. And because I asked myself, what drives my philanthropy? It wasn't about uh, leaving a name or, or building uh, a name for myself. It was about I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm an ordinary person, citizen of a country that I love, in the continent that I love. And I think it's not right that for me as an individual to think of my life as, uh, as divorced from the community from which I grew up and was a part of, and see it as I'm doing a favor when I do philanthropic work. I'm not doing anybody a favor. That's my attitude. It's a call that I have put, a call of duty that I've put upon myself. So it makes it easy. If there's a partner who has more resources than I have but can get the job done, I'll go and give them the resources. If there's a partner who's smaller than me but is more effective in what they do, I say go for it. I'm not looking if they ask, so what do you want in return? All I want is to be able to have impact that we make a difference. This applies to my, whether it's my philanthropic work or serving on the board of another organization like the End Fund or as part of APF. The greater goal of solving the challenges that Africa faces is more important to me than the validation and the endorsement through having my name put on something. So once you make that decision, it's very easy to be more objective in looking at uh, 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 requests that come my way and, and see them more as partnerships than as opportunities for my name to be known or whatever. So it's been very helpful and I, I like it. it makes things very simple. So when your name is not mentioned, you're not offended. When you don't get a seat at top table, you're not complaining. If you know people don't sing songs of Solomon about you, yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's a good place to be in. I always hard to follow Cici. Um But um, uh, she did uh, refresh my memory a little bit. And um, I had this very significant event uh, when I was in, in first, between first and second year of college. Um, I had a, a very nice girlfriend. Uh, um, uh, who I thought we were doing swimmingly well, um, but you know, came June or July, comes this letter which I carefully open, and it is the ultimate Dear John letter written, Dear Bill. Uh, and basically she said, well, you're, you're a perfectly nice human being, but you're never going to amount to anything. Uh, well, you know, I went to work the next day, and I have never been the same. Uh, I, you know, so I call myself now an activist philanthropist, but the reality is, I was just an activist, and uh, and 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 um, and and you know, life has done me very, very well. And when it came to to philanthropy and the end fund, um, and it was time for me to give back in a major way, back to your your friend in Silicon Valley. 
You know, at some point, you really can't accomplish anything more with your career or your business or whatever. Nothing that is really, really, truly, um, you know, personally rewarding. And um, so I've gone into philanthropy in the same activist way that I've done pretty much everything since Susan wrote me off. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, 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 you know, uh, in the end fund, I just, you know, back to what I was saying earlier, we just try to run the place with best practices. We really communicate incredibly well, both as a board and with the management. And the management is, is out on the road all the time. The board joins them both on the board, on, on the road when they can. And, uh, so, you know, the reality is in, you know, listen, that doesn't, isn't obviously reflective of how rich you are. You know, Bill Gates is an activist philanthropist. He gets the hell out of that office and he sees and he touches and he believes. And, and you know, Bill Campbell's got, got a lot less zeros, but he can be as involved. Uh, and, and, you know, I just urge all of you to, most of you work in the field, um, stick with it, um, and 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 in reality, you know, you producer, entertainment, anybody can contribute if they put their mind to it. And it isn't all about checks. It's 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 something about checks if you got the checks to write. But if you if you've got a soul and a heart, you can also be a great philanthropist. Terrific! Don't you want to clone these individuals? I mean, I. My final question, because we're out of time. There are many generals who made money but didn't give it away. There are many billionaires who decided to keep it for themselves. How are you cloning the next generations of Titsi Masiwas, Bill Campbells, and T. White Danjimas in your family and in our world? Can I start with you? How are you passing this philanthropic energy down to your children and to others. My two daughters are involved in my foundation. And I thought this is the school where they will have a first hand knowledge of the art of giving. Giving, but not just giving, but anonymous giving. Giving, donating to a cause that it's worthy. They are the next generation, and I hope they will carry on. I'm getting repetitive, so we'll go. <laughs> I involve my family in everything that I do. I love to go to the community. For me, that's the best place I find I'm most connected and effective. And I take my kids with me. We have a, we call it a mantra in, in, in higher life, that we go where they, they are, the people that we work with, in communities, we go where they are, we sleep where they sleep. I go to sleep in the rural communities, I have no problems with that. And we eat what they eat. Uh, how do I change what the kids are eating if I'm frightened to eat what they're eating? And then we sit down and hear them share their stories and then find ways in which we can help them achieve their God-given purpose. So that's what, I, so I live that and I find it most enjoyable. This is not a job I do. This is part of my calling, and, and it's something I, I'm willing to stand up and, and speak about and be a part of. Pretty similarly, um, you know, the Fam Foundation was formed so that my children could see my true beliefs in life. Um, my eldest daughter gave the mission to the Foundation which we learned here in Africa on a trip, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, our mission became low-cost interventions that can change people's lives. And the end fund, for somewhere between 25 and 50 cents a year, 
we can essentially keep those children in school where they belong to be. And so I'm quite secure that the next generation will have similar beliefs and hopefully after that. Thank you. So Thank you so much. I'll end with my favorite quote, which is by Nelson Mandela, which says, vision without action is just a dream. Action without vision just passes the time, but vision with action can change the world. You'll agree with me that these individuals have vision and are acting to change our world. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you so much, Chiti Matsiba, for all you do. Thank you, Bill Campbell, for your life of example. And thank you, T.Y. Danjima, for giving your time, treasure, and talents. Please give them another round of applause.